God didn't chastise Job for asking the questions. He revealed himself. Yeah. Nothing was fixed. He was still covered with boy, boils and ostracized and poor and sad. But he said, oh. All right, y'all, I have to, to start today with a confession. Um, I had a spirit of bitterness at a women's conference not too long ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we all go to Christian women's conferences, and I love them. I tease and call them estrogen festivals. But they had told me ahead of time, we're going to focus on Psalm 42. And so I spent all this time studying Psalm 42. And you, Psalm 42 is a sad mm -hmm. song. It's actually written with Psalm 43. And basically the question throughout mm -hmm. Psalm 42 and 43 is, how long, oh Lord, like this is hard. How much longer? So, I mean, I spent hours studying Psalm 42. I get there, I walk in. And, uh, you know, Psalm 42 includes the, includes the verses about um, how deep is the roar of your waterfalls, what deep calls deep. And what the psalmist is saying there, it's not David, it's these worship leaders. They're going, I feel like I'm drowning. I feel like I'm underwater. The women who put on this conference had redone the whole front of this convention center in waterfalls, gotten these poor husbands to go to Home Depot. I mean, they, they had recreated Hawaii. Mm -hmm. They met me with a lay and chocolate covered macadamia nuts. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, I'm not sure where to go from here because they made it all happy, clappy Hawaii. And I'm like, this is not happy, not clappy. <laughs> this not vacation. is yeah. hard. Psalm 42 <laughs> starts as the deer pants for flowing streams. I love that he says he's a deer, not a camel. He can't hold on to the water he needs. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my, my soul pants for you, O oh God, my soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before the Lord? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me continually, where is your God. There's a bunch of people saying, if he's such a good God, why does your life look like that? It's a really sad mm -hmm. song. You know, all the Psalms, I think of them, Jade, I think of them as the prayer journal. You and I both have, <laughs> have a hard ones. time doing ourselves. <laughs> um, all of the Psalms, there's 150, were, were originally written as songs. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like God's Spotify list. And half of them are sad. Mm -hmm. Half of them are Psalms, prayers, mm -hmm of lament where, where these ancient believers are going, this is hard. This isn't what I thought I was signing up for. You know, I thought I'd become a Christian and I'd have a high metabolism and hair that's not chemically dependent and a <laughs> husband with hair and money. I mean, you know, they just, they, they thought it'd be easier. Um, one of my favorite books on the Psalms of Lament, it's an oldie, but it's a goldie. Michael Card wrote it, but uh, it's called A Sacred Sorrow. That's good. And in this book, he said, the lamentable journey began through Adam for all mankind, but the heartbreaking sorrow of the three, Adam, Eve, and God, was not and could never be beyond his perfect intention. It was a sovereign sorrow that fell upon the world, a wordless sorrow beyond our knowing. And as his loving wisdom does with all things, even and especially with our sin, God would redeem their disobedience and sorrow, transforming it by means of his said, his mercy, into a pathway back to the loving kindness of his presence. It was a shadowy path that began outside the garden. It meanders through all our lives, inevitably leading us through the darkest valleys of our fallen experience. But we must never forget that it is a path, that it is going somewhere. That's the thing I love about the Psalms the most. Uh, John Calvin, old dead theologian, brilliant guy, uh, wrote this thing called the Institutes. And John Calvin says about the Psalms, he says, they record the continuum of human emotion, they record both the dancing and the weeping of God's people. So God doesn't say, just come before me with your perky emotions. He says, come before me with everything. And usually you'll feel at the same time or at least in the same day. It's kind of like the weather in Florida. <laughs> weather in Florida, if it's storming, just wait for 30 minutes and you'll see the sun. That's a human psyche. We experience all kinds of things on any given day. God says, come before me with all of that. Be honest about it, and um, he will give us immeasurably more. 
as we talk about prayer this week, I thought we're going to get into some, I think, redeemed weeds. I want to go a little deep where it's a little more tangled and talk about a season of lament in your own life where you ask those questions, maybe a few different semantics, but but where effectively you said, I can't see you. Mm -hmm. And where walking with the Lord felt more uphill than downhill Mm -hmm. and how that has shaped your life. We were, um, I can't remember what year, maybe 10 or year 11 from my husband in the NFL. And I thought he was going to retire, which I was super excited about, but he didn't. That's another story. Um, and then we moved where away from the place we had just found church. Mm. Like, you know, people say, where do you go to church? And like, we had just found yeah. church and community and friends. And we moved to a completely different state and where we had no church, no community uh, and no friends. And uh, we wanted to have another baby. So at this point we had five. I always say I'm an even, I like even numbers. I wanted everyone to have a friend, <laughs> partner, someone to hold on to so that I could hold on to my husband and everybody could have a partner. Um, and we actually experienced our first miscarriage. And it was during the season. So, I mean, I remember having to do all the the appointments by myself to go in and get checked. And because he was either, he was working and then we didn't have a babysitter. So it was just crazy. So I felt really alone. Yeah. And then I didn't tell anyone. And I remember not being mad. I think it was, I was so busy that I don't remember having time to be angry or to say, God, why? Um, But then after the season, four months later, we decided to try again Mm -hmm. and had another miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember that exact question of like, we're trying to do something good. You know, it's like this Mm -hmm. idea, like what I'm doing is the godly thing to do. Like, God, why would you, you know, it's like all those questions of Mm -hmm. why, why again? Um, And I think I had not grieved the first one. And so it was like double time on me. And I just think, and I was like, then on top of that, you moved me away from a church. Mm -hmm. I have no community. You know, it was just this list of like, like pointing the finger. Like, I just remember it was the first time that I felt 100% 100% out of control and not knowing what God was going to do. Yeah. And it was really scary. Mm-hmm. And I was really sad. Yeah. Sad is not the right word. Yeah. Like I was beyond Almost that. despondent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I just remember not just always going back to like, okay, Lord, I, I'm not going to say you're not good, but I do not see this as being right. good. Right. And I remember going to church the first time. I remember the three songs that played at church that I would sing before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. 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 And in my head, I knew, I I had an idea of what that meant. Yeah, yes, Lord, take me deep, show my faith. I believe that you're good. And those songs came up and I was like. Yeah, I didn't want to sing it. Whoa, like that has a whole new meaning. Yeah. And I, I was like, Lord, wow. and my prayer during that was like, I want to say this again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But God, I can't say it now. Like bring me to a right. place where I can sing it in right. freedom again. Right. Um, but it's not today. Jesus modeled lamenting for us in a lot of different ways. Certainly there was a heaviness uh, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross was before him. There was a heaviness when he was on the cross. He wept over the city. He had a broken heart when John the Baptist was beheaded, um, even though he went on to heal, went on to feed the 5,000. But those real human emotions, Jesus showed us that this is a normal part of living on earth in brokenness and in, in a sinful, sinful humanity. Like you're going to have those times. And, you know, I love in Matthew, right before he feeds, right after he feeds the 5,000, he withdraws. He tries to withdraw to be in a quiet or desolate place because he's grieving uh, the weight of the death of John the Baptist. And so sometimes even in our lament, God's like, I need you on mission. There's things for us to do. You don't always have the space to cut everything off and grieve. You can still be in the heaviness of the emotion and healing and feeding and doing all these things. And at the right time, God will give you that space as he gave Jesus to withdraw and to just sit in that emotion and let God refresh and minister minister to us. I think it's so important for us to talk about this because all of the saints in Scripture went through seasons where they lost their grief. Mm -hmm. Isaiah asked God why. Jeremiah asked God why. Job asked God why. All the psalmists asked God why. 
-hmm. Jesus Mm -hmm. asked God why. And I think we tend to, um, as Christ followers, curate our emotions Mm -hmm. and only bring kind of the, the positive end of the continuum before the Lord as if either he'll be disappointed in us Mm -hmm. Or somehow we can sully his reputation Mm -hmm. if we admit we're struggling. And I'm like, he's so kind. He gave us story after story of humanity, Mm -hmm. of people who went, this is hard. In the Psalms, all those prayers, it's not just dancing. They record weeping Mm -hmm. and dancing. Mm -hmm. And yet we're kind of like, oh, I'm fine. I'm a believer. Praise God. We go from glory to glory, which is a terrible exegesis. That's not talking about our emotional state. It's talking about the faithfulness of God, first covenant and second covenant. I know you wouldn't now, but then was there any guilt that you weren't faithful enough, which is why you're asking why? It was more so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, we don't deserve to have this type of pain. Now that's, that's a whoa, whoa moment. That's, but it's right? wonderful. But it was very real. Yeah. When I say God doesn't waste anything, mm-hmm. um, it comes from a place of recognizing even in our pain, like it draws people to Jesus, mm-hmm. yeah. even when you're not even trying yeah. to. Mm-hmm. And it was just me breaking that silence of what I was feeling and how like honestly real feeling that other other women would be like, I had one too and never told anyone. Yeah. How, you know, it's just, it became something. I was like, I don't even really want to talk about this, but people want to talk about mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. And so again, it's like one of those things where it's like, I don't know if God used that for that, mm-hmm. but I, because it happened, that's how I've been used in that mm-hmm. space to, and I, I, I just, it took a while to get there. And I still mm-hmm. think about it when I'm putting up, you know, stockings at Christmas, like we're missing someone. But um, yeah, I, I think that was the first time I was definitely raw before the Lord. You know, when you battle shame or you carry shame, um, it can be a real spiritual doozy because the very healing for our shame is Jesus. And prayer is one of the ways that we most connect with Jesus. And so the enemy, the the pain that we've been through, the lies in our minds, the things that we've believed actually cause us to run from Christ rather than to run toward Christ. So if you're struggling with shame and prayer, I just wanna encourage you, prayer, that encounter with God himself through his son, Christ Jesus, is actually the remedy for your shame. So get there, even if it's just halting step by halting step, he will meet you and you'll start to feel the um, talons of shame loosen and come undone because he's that good. So I'm going to be reading Psalm chapter 62, verse eight. This is in the NIV. It says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him for God is our refuge. I feel like this verse is just a warm blanket on a cold day because it reminds us that when we're feeling scared, um, when we're feeling weak, when we feel that we don't have the strength to go on, that we can pour out our heart. We can let God know where we are and how we feel and he will be our safe place. He will be our place of refuge. I love how it says, trust in him at all times, Um, not when it's easy to trust, not when, you know, things are going well, but even in those times where trust is scary and trust feels sacrificial, I think that's when God can prove that he truly is our refuge. We want you to join the conversation and connect with us on social media. Ask a question, share a prayer request, and make friends with women all over the world. We really are better together, y'all. So this is uh, Dan Allender's book, uh, The Language of the Soul, and it's about emotions. And he said, the laments of the Psalms encourage us to risk the danger of speaking boldly and personally to the Lord. The laments are refusals to settle for the way things are. They are acts of relentless hope that believes no situation falls outside of Yahweh's capacity for transformation. The Psalms invite us to, to question God, but they do this in the context of worship. They were the hymnal used. God invites us then to bring before him our rage, our doubt and terror, but he intends for us to do so as a part of worship. 
Yeah. So. It's yeah. so profound because we're comfortable with systematic theology. Mm-hmm. Everybody's comfortable with Romans 8. Yeah, it's up here. But you go to, why have you left me? Mm-hmm. Why are my tears? And everybody goes, oh, well, they, they, just, they just weren't trusting the Lord. I'm like, well, of course yeah. they weren't. Yeah. The yeah. They were being human. Yeah. And I just feel like we sanitize mm-hmm. too much of our sadness and yet we live in a broken world and it's untrue to to say that a question is also doubt um, because there's some element of faith that i have in the existence of god to even pose the question in the first place at least i believe he's alive and that he hears and it could be different i had to go through a season of losing just about everything to see grief as not being a bad thing or punishment but to see the fact that my heart longed for something different. It was like my faith putting Mm. SOS rocks on the beach, believing God would see it and would come to my rescue. So I I love what Allender says there. I love that God included it in Holy Red. Yeah. Because he could have edited out the hard parts and the sad parts, and he didn't. He put it there for our encouragement. Mm -hmm. And then I love that you said it's part of worship. You know, in rabbinical tradition, our friend Christy McClellan talks about this all the time. Um, in rabbinical tra- tradition, questioning was part of worship. Mm-hmm. That was considered a, more of a mature follower, a uh, more mature rabbinical student would go, but why? Why? Those weren't doubt. It was, I want to know more. Show me more of who you are. Show me in the dark who you are. Seeing lament as an act of worship would deepen our intimacy with God in the same way that if you are in relationship with a human being, it's not the people that just see you when you're happy that know you. It's the people that see you when you're happy and you're sad that know you more. And so I, I think giving our lament and our tears and our grief to God simply creates the atmosphere for us to give our entire selves to God. And and by giving your entire self to God, then there's this this intimacy that forms because now you're not holding anything back from Him, but you're actually laying your life down as a living sacrifice, not just your body, not just your intellect, but your full self. I think we tend to perceive church leaders as less than human when it comes to emotions. And I think if people make decisions to leave a church or struggle, I think, I think sometimes we forget like that hurts that. I mean, it doesn't matter how much you love God and he's going to do more, blah, blah, blah. Your feelings get hurt. And so it's almost like it's not parenting. They're not your kids. They're adults, Mm -hmm. but having shepherding a group of people really just creates more opportunities (laughs) for hurt and disappointment. And so I think there was a season where, and here's the crazy part. Just like while you were dealing with the weight of miscarriage, you still had children that were alive and doing well and a husband. Like you can be dealing with deep lament mm-hmm. and there's other areas of your life where That's right. the That's Lord right. is flourishing, right. you know? And so it's, I think it's so hard to figure out how do I stay yeah. Yeah. present yeah. in yeah. all these things? Yeah. I wanna, I wanna be honest about my lament and my pain, and mm-hmm. not feel ungrateful yes, for all, <laughs> for the all these, uh, right? Yeah. So right. that that has been a hard thing, honestly, to navigate. Yeah. And I found, you know, I love the story of Job, yeah. and I think the Lord has given me a freedom to ask questions yeah. and to say. Okay, God, I don't get it. Yeah. And sometimes he's like, you're not going to get it. Yeah. yeah. But still say what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I think there's an intention behind that. Like, what do I feel like you owe me? Or am I curious about your hand? Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So that has been the hard part for me. You know, I can still feel the sadness, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to, I, I'm like, okay, Lord, I want to be curious in my grief, I'm, I'm sad, I'm disappointed, right. but I still trust you. And I don't want to feel like asking this question means I don't trust you. <laughs> you know, right. It's a whole right. yeah. thing right. that's swirling in your head all the time. And so I have done better with just saying, here's how I feel. Mm-hmm. 
And my problem is loving the Bible, being a Bible teacher, my brain has an answer for everything I feel. Right. My right. brain's like, yeah, but this scripture says, right. and I'm like, hold on, I know. <laughs> I know it says that, but also here's how I feel. Right. Yeah. And so that has been hard, but healthy for me because at the end of the day, um, when I'm okay being in that place, even though there's a scripture that answers it and all that, mm-hmm. when I'm okay just being in those emotions and not being led by them, but just being in yes. them, I feel very created. Like I have a creator. Yes. I feel very made like, oh, I am not the origin. (laughs) Like I feel very dependent. And so it actually then flips and becomes a depth that I have with the Lord where before he answers. Right. It's just a dependency that comes from the creation, depending on his creator. And, And that has been probably... One of the hardest but most necessary things. Boy, again, going back to scripture, everything you need for life, for wholeness, for healing, for abundance, for intimacy, for relationships, everything is in these pages. And most of it is in the context of narrative. It's stories. So you can find yourself on the pages. And over and over and over again, you see these people who were not segregated in their emotions. They weren't happy for a season and then sad for a season. They usually experience grief and abundance at the same time, joy and weeping at the same time. That's life. When I was waiting uh, to get my daughter from Haiti through the process of adoption, man, there were times that I thought, "I, I feel like my heart has been cut out of my chest. And at the same time, I'd be rejoicing at a friend's baby shower because God had given her and her husband a baby. that That's life. We don't get life in these neat curated little pieces. Life is messy and it's wonderful. And God says, come to me when you're crying and come to me when you're laughing. I love that you brought up Job. I spent a year in Job. Didn't write anything. I just spent a year in Job. And when God told me to go to Job, because I am a player, I'm a poser, I will hide. I'll do all kinds of things to keep from feeling my own sadness. And for years, I thought if I went there, I would drown. I mean, I think subconsciously, I thought I would die if I actually explored some of the, um, some of the wounds from my past. And God wanted to heal me, and I just wouldn't sit still yeah. in it. And so when he just um, allowed me to lose everything that I thought gave me, except for him, hope, and everything else, um, he said as clear as a bell, he said, Lisa, you've been running your whole life, mm-hmm. so I'm going to take you to the basement, and I'm going to sit there with you in the dark until fear doesn't own you anymore. Mm-hmm. And it was it was dark. Mm-hmm. And what arrested me in Job, the very beginning, was where it says he lost everything that mattered, his kids, most importantly, and then his health, his wealth. It says he shaved his head and he tore his robe. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't pretending, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm fine, I'm fine, no, I'm fine, how can I pray for you? He wasn't pretending, he was being honest. Mm -hmm. But in the exact same verse, it says he worshipped. Mm-hmm. And I always thought, to be honest about what I was grieving, mm-hmm. a lost adoption, no marriage, mm-hmm. a stocking missing, you know, something, a dad not showing up. I thought to be honest about that meant I would lose my joy. Mm-hmm. And what slayed me was being honest about where I asked why, and sometimes he doesn't answer the question, but his presence There was a lid over my joy. It's not binary. It's not sad and I lose my faith or I lose my... It's actually holistic. You go, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I actually, my my joy increased Mm -hmm. when I trusted him in the dark. Um, Mm -hmm. Like there's still deep ends of my life, but I don't think I'm going to drown anymore. Right, right. And so I think the freedom, instead of us having that binary thinking of I'm either sad Mm -hmm. Or I'm joyful and faith filled. It's like, yeah. actually, there's a holistic. Yes. You can have great joy mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. celebrating who He is as a good, good God, mm-hmm. and weep 
not just not just in the same week, mm-hmm. at the same the time. time. Right. Yeah, same yeah, time. yeah. God in His faithfulness, even though He spoke so much about who He was and reveals just a reminder of His sovereignty and omniscience, all these things. It's what Job's heart needed because in. In chapter 42, he says, I used to know of you by the hearing of the ears. Right. And now my eyes see you, right? Yes. right. Yeah. So I I think that God, it's not that he doesn't say, don't ask the question, don't be in the place, but but know that when I reveal who I am to you, yeah. right. even before I respond to that, that's what's going to shift it. And here's the thing that's crazy about me. My friends who've known me my whole life, they'll tell you. I have probably cried more in the last 10 years than I've cried my whole entire life because I spent my life being so emotionally guarded. Right. You, nothing was going to bother me. Yeah. Life happens. Yeah. You'll be okay. Whatever. Everybody needs to suck it up. And at some point, eight or nine years ago, I don't even remember what it was, but the Lord just started breaking breaking yeah. that yeah. guard. Yeah. And now it's so funny. I get up to teach Bible study <laughs> and the people be like, here's your tissue box. And I'm like, who is this person? But it's like, once you open that yeah. door, that's it. Your own lament, yeah. right? Opens you up to genuine compassion for oh, others. Yeah. Because if I can't lament, mm-hmm. I can't lament that's for right. you. That's it right. also opens you up to Jesus. Yeah. He was a man of sorrows. He was, but I wouldn't He got prepared that. for the cross by <laughs> suffering. And we always have him happy, clappy, yeah. you know, dancing on the Sea of Galilee. And I'm like, we forget that as incarnate Messiah, he wept. Yeah. We don't have to curate our emotions. Yeah. I think for me, there's lament always in some degree, right? Like, what is, what is trauma if not the memory of pain? Like, that's not a real deep, but it's true. Like, yeah. Yeah. you're always remembering what hurt because you're hurt, you know, you get triggered by a look or a hug or a touch or a situation or a scenario. And so I think lament has, it's, it's actually just a lifestyle, I think, to a certain degree. Um, I think one of the darker times, and I, I was thinking, I was like, do I share this? Cause I don't have like this super, you know, altar call like ending to it. But it's like when I went through a uh, prenatal depression, and was like, I was like, I think something's wrong with me because it's not that I want to kill myself, but I don't want to be alive. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I guess maybe yeah. that's suicidal. You yeah. know, like the, the yes. language isn't yeah. coming out like yeah. how it is on right. TV, yeah. but it's, it's given, I don't want to be here. Right. And I remember um, there was like one day where I was just trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And Preston, uh, he didn't know what was wrong with me because I didn't tell him, but my husband, TBN, and (laughs) he had left because he had to go to like a a get together or something like that. And there was something about him leaving where I felt so dramatically alone, Mm. just dramatically. And I was just like, Lord, I don't know what to do. So there was no question to the Lord. It was, I wasn't curious. I wasn't, because when you're so depressed, you don't have questions. You're just here. You're just existing. And I I guess the grace is that the Lord knew that. You know what I'm saying? Like he knew that I didn't have language to get me out of that situation. And so he brought me out with medicine. And so I'm so grateful. But he he's grateful in this. I mean, he's gracious in the sense that even the medicine wasn't something that I had to take forever. You know, like he used that as a, as a temporary bomb and so I could get to the other side and just have a legitimate and authentic joy. Lament is a lifestyle for me because there are so many avenues for grief in my life, right? Like personally, I've been hurt, I've been ab- abandoned, I've been rejected by family, by friends, and currently in different ways. There are always places of suffering, whether that's someone you know that is sick or someone you know that is dying. There is grief from seeing what is happening in the world. There is sex trafficking, there is racism, there is misogyny in the church. And that's why we have the hope of saying Maranatha, Jesus comes soon. And when he comes soon, he has already promised that every tear that you didn't you didn't cry he gonna wipe them away do you trust god more having been through a season where you couldn't even ask why you did ask why i went to the basement i think for me pain dry seasons desert seasons have been the doorway to intimacy and so um having a backstory as an actor um when i came back to christ 
he really pretty gently but quickly ministered to me that I'd become a better actor in my own life, you know, which I was a better actor off the stage um, than I was on. And so pain and dry seasons uh, for me are the places where I can sit at the bottom of the well and say the real things and experience his love and his ministry there. I don't know who came up with it, but the greatest um, reframing of the word intimacy that I have ever heard is into me see. And I can't help but think of Hagar running away in her desert season, and she's in desperate straits, and yet she sees the living one who sees her. And so we are never out of God's sight. We are never out of His view. We are never on the periphery. We're never on the back row. But sometimes when I'm in a tough season, I need the grace, to God's grace for me, that I might see the living one who sees me. And so when I can uh, apprehend that truth, all of a sudden I can move more deeply into intimacy. I can give Him who I really am, and I know that He can handle every bit of it. We've been talking about, is it okay to ask God questions? And it certainly is. We see it in Scripture. But one of the things God's done for me in my dark seasons is that He's asked me questions. Mm. And um, I think of Elijah when he's had this huge ministry battle, and he, he runs into the desert, and he sits down under a tree, and he says, in the line with me, I don't want to live anymore. I'm done. Yeah. And rather than preach him a sermon or whatever. Um, The angel of the Lord ministers a a, a nap and some food. And then he says, do it again. And then as they start to move on into the journey, God asks Elijah, what are we doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? And I feel like the Lord in my own life so many times in that place is, what are we doing here, Allison? Not, what are we doing here? What are we doing? doing here. And I think of Hagar, and I've been astonished that we serve a God who would dialogue with us. Yeah. Yeah. Dialogue with the woman in a desert oppressed, running away, wanting something else. Mm -hmm. And God, the angel of the Lord, dialogues with this woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what he says is, where have you come from, Hagar? Where are you going? going? And they're such simple things. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's like, what are we doing here, Elijah? Mm -hmm. Where are you, Adam? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? When I have a God who cares enough to say, where have you come from? Where are you going? Where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. It brings me all the way back, if not cognitively, Mm -hmm. here to the cross. What I love about uh, what you just said with the cross is like, we miss the fact that on the cross, Jesus asked a question. Yeah. Yeah. He was curious. Yeah. Why? Why have you forsaken? Right. So there's a, yeah. there's a sense in which following Jesus should make us curious about our suffering right. and that's our right. pain. Like we should that's be inquisitive. Right. If the son right. asks the father yes. a question, yes. about one in which he knows the answer to, right. 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 <laughs> then right. how much more right. should yeah. we do it? Yeah. And it's, it's Paul. It's like, okay, God, this thorn, yes. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's got to go, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, he wasn't all like, my grace is sufficient before he asked. <laughs> like, I'm just like, sometimes you don't even see, you can't even process that there's something good in this or there's something about God that's going to be revealed in this because you're just like, I don't want to be in this. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And there's so much in that one verse. I mean, we talk about anxiety and how the Lord has commanded us to really walk in peace based on this. But when you think about the fact that Paul is telling us in 
in whatever the heaviness is that you're wrestling with, you can make your request known to God. God is an invitational God. Even though he's the creator of the universe, he invites us to share with him the heaviness on our hearts. Um, and also, even in that heaviness, there has to still be a spirit of gratitude. So we make our request known to God with thanksgiving. And that's just a reminder that God, while I'm still wanting things from you, still needing things from you, you still have done so much. And so we can live in the place of wanting something from God and still live in deep gratitude. And I think that's the beauty of Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Psalm 103, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. What I love about this verse is that it's not dependent. My praise isn't dependent on outside situations, the externals, the circumstances. I can command my soul, bless the Lord. Let all that's within me praise. I get to tell myself, I direct my worship. Is he worthy? Yes, he's worthy. Whether I feel it or not, whether I'm an inspired moment or not, he is worthy. And I, and I get to jumpstart my spirit with the truth. And we always catch on. I also want to address that some of this might be assumptions that have been passed along through a different generation, mm. yes. right? And so I feel yeah. like my dream- You mean the don't question God? Yeah, yeah. like I feel yeah. like- see yeah. that as- I feel like yeah. millennials yeah. and Gen Z, yeah. I think we are very active in being like, nah, why? Question. What's up? Yeah. Why is right. this happening? Yeah. Right. But I, I do think That's the good. previous generation, there was kind of this, this assumption that curiosity was a lack of reverence and honor. And, and, and so how do you good. speak yeah. to even the generational assumption- That's good. That we shouldn't question God. That's mm. good. But I do assume mm -hmm. that for most people, it's that there, there's a barrier when it comes to asking a question of God and that they would have sent I me mean, because I thought you're not a good girl. That's irreverent. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. I could not ask questions in church. Yeah. And I already felt like, yeah, I felt so dirty and so damaged when I got saved because there had been sexual molestation. My dad had left. So I just thought I've got to keep my head down and be a good girl. To me, to ask questions is to be not a good girl. Yeah. And so I do love that the freedom, almost a common grace he's brought with more your age, we're almost 30 years apart, is you go, well, no, I don't understand. You have more that healthy Job because God didn't, God didn't chastise Job for asking the questions. He revealed himself. Yeah. And I love that Job said, oh, Never now I see. <laughs> nothing was redeemed yet. Yeah, he wasn't right. reconciled with his wife. He didn't have it. Nothing was fixed. He was still covered with boy, boils and ostracized and poor and sad. But he said, oh. There's no punishment for questioning God. Jesus questioned God. Why have you forsaken me? Job questioned God. How have I come to this place in life? So many times we see people asking questions because God understands that we are limited and finite and our ways are not his ways, our thoughts are not our thoughts. Of course, we're going to not understand everything he's doing. Now, when I ask the question, there's not a demand that God has to answer me and answer me the way I want. He may not answer the way you want. Sometimes it's like Job and Job says, how did I get here? I thought I was a pretty good person. And then God goes on to show off his character and his power. So the answer may not always line up with the question, but there's definitely an openness and invitation from God for us to be honest with him because we cannot receive the ministry of God to meet us in our deepest need if we're not even honest about that need, to meet us in our deepest frustration or in our point of depression or when we have questions as to why this is happening. We cannot see the power of God meet us in that weakest place if we're not honest enough to open ourselves up and say, God, here is where I'm struggling. Here is where I wish I had more faith, whatever the case may be. And so uh, if you're wondering how to ask God a question, just ask God a question. I just think that if you read scripture, like we've been talking about, yeah. Elijah, Jesus, Paul, Job, like yeah. you can't understand these people's lives yeah. and, and still come to the conclusion that you can never ask God a yeah, question. Right. I think mm -hmm. With almost anything, if you read the scripture, you will say, yeah. oh, this yes. has happened. Right. And this this wasn't banned. Jesus didn't come back that's and right. say, stop questioning the Lord, that's you know, right. because right. in the New that's Testament, right. Paul right. entreats the Lord, you know. So right. it's, right. 
I think if you just read scripture and see see it for what it is, there's a reason that God used human beings and their stories yeah. and their personalities and their approach so that we could find ourselves in that and say, oh, okay, Paul did ask the Lord three times too. You, yeah. you bold, bro. You, you said right. it the first time That's and right. he didn't get struck. That's so right. I just think the way you speak to those older generations or whatever is yeah. the barrier that keeps you from asking those questions is to mm-hmm. say, just search the scripture. Look at That's how right. God has been intentional yeah. about putting the questions of men and women in the scripture so that we can yeah. know this is a normal part of the experience and God meets us. God meets us. Yeah. In I love that we talked about Hannah, about prayer, because her prayer was not formulaic. Yeah. You know, it was not formal the way prayers would have been in that era. It was she brought all of her yeah. to all of God. And I think that's one of the things I want to get better at yeah. is to not curate my prayer life. Yeah. If it's messy, if it if it's not something somebody else would go, oh, she sounds like a mature believer. She That, that woman's whacked when she prays. I want to bring all of me to all of him and trust him. Um, Trust that he wants to hear it, that he inclines his ear. Also trust that he's the safest person with my secrets. The Holy Spirit will poke me and go, Lisa, you're wearing a mask. And when I wear a mask, it's like I might as well voluntarily step behind bars. I just, I, I get in a prison of sorts because it ends up causing separation between me and my community definitely causes separation between me and God. That lie that you've got to clean yourself up first and then come before others or before the Lord, that is not the gospel. You will not read that anywhere in the Bible. Jesus has come to me. You don't have to clean yourself up first. And so he continues to teach me that if I'm if I'm really physically tired uh, or I or I feel shame. Uh, old lies about that I don't deserve or if anybody really looked under the hood of my life, they wouldn't love me. Uh, those will sometimes cause me to want to hide and put up a more, uh, a better facade than who I really am. And then the Holy Spirit will poke me and he'll go, honey, you know where this leads? This leads to death of joy and this leads to loneliness. And I'm like, yes, yeah, sir. When he says that, I peel off my emotional spanks and I and I step back out into community honestly and also that changes that changes the body like the more authentic we can be with the Lord the more authentic I believe that we can be with people even with knowing that they could misuse our truth our 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 vulnerability yeah and I think that is what shifts Uh, That is what creates a space for the Holy Spirit to come in and move and work and heal and speak when we're able to be honest before the Lord. Because I think we talked about it earlier. It's like, how can I be honest with other people? I'm not honest with him first. So we show people, we tell people how we lament Mm -hmm. and how we ask the questions. We show, Mm -hmm. we tell, we commune. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That changes. That just, it just changes the atmosphere because it makes, it makes you say, well, I can have that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's go. As we were wrapping up, I thought I there there's somebody listening who feels stuck and sad. And they may come from a background where they think sad is bad. Yeah. And I so resonated, Jackie, when you said I wasn't suicidal necessarily, mm-hmm. but I didn't want to wake up to another day. Yeah. Um there's somebody who feels that right now and feels stuck in it. Will you pray that even in that sorrow, yeah. that they feel God's presence is close yes. to the brokenhearted, and that also they'll sense they're moving towards something, yeah. that they're they're not bad because they're sad, yeah. that He hasn't, He's not yeah. looking at them in disapproval. Yeah. 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 Amen. Be glad to. Jesus. Um, You were sad too. And so, Father, for a man or a woman who is stuck in sorrow, you are right there with them. Father, I thank you that your word promises that you are close to the brokenhearted. Father, I pray for somebody watching today. I pray you would hold them together in their difficulty. 
you would be with them in deep water. You'd pick them up and cart them on your back. Father, I pray for a pressing of hope where hope has run out. I pray that they would have a sense, Lord, that they would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Father, we pray for anybody right now who feels like they don't want to wake up tomorrow. Would you intervene in that place? Would you crawl in the bed next to them? Would you give them a friend? Lord, would you get them to a therapist? Would you give them the courage to talk to a doctor? Father, we just, in the name of Jesus, in that name, Lord, we are interceding for someone. And we're asking you to move them through to life again. Let them know there's hope, there's a future, there's joy, there's purpose, and there's your presence. Do it, Father. We love you, we bless you, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Connect with us on social media and let us know how our team can pray for you. We are answering your questions behind the scenes at Better Together. Are you ready? Kind of. Depends on the question. Okay. So our viewer, Shannon, asked us, how can I keep God's will at the forefront of my mind when I pray? Oh, that's a good question. Um, great question, Shannon. And, and I'm going to give you a real simple answer. Usually I like to try to remember something Greek or Hebrew, but I can't remember anything Greek or Hebrew right now. To keep God's will at the, at the forefront of your mind, of our mind when, when any of us pray, is to remember that you're having a relational conversation. Um, Jesus is the first rabbi to tell us that we can call God Dad, Father, when we approach Him. And then in the New Testament, three different times during prayer, we're told you can call the God of the universe, Ho Patir. In Greek, that means dad, dad, or father, dad. It's like they're just emphasizing we have a relationship with God. It's not a monologue. It's not a performance. You don't have to have a DJ voice. You just have to come before him honestly and remember, this is the God who loves you. His face lights up into a grin when he sees you come and he sings songs of delight over you. When you remember it's a relational conversation, he's holy, but he allows us to come before him. He allows us to have conversation. He even tells us, I incline my ear to listen to you. He's not distracted. He is absolutely focused on us. If you'll remember that relational context of prayer, it'll help you keep God's will at the forefront of what you're asking. That's good. All right, Jackie, Deborah asked us, this comes from Facebook. She says, this is a great question too. Does God ever get tired of hearing our prayer request? Is it okay to pray about the same thing? Well, I think one, I think maybe the the underlying assumption is that God is is like our, our fathers right. on earth or our, the people that we know. Like people are easily irritated. God isn't. That's God right. is, is eternally patient. So that's one. That's Two, right. I think when you even look at the Lord's prayer, the Lord's prayer was given not to say once, but to say always, That's right. our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our uh, daily bread. If we right. ask for daily bread, that means we're praying for daily bread every day. That's right. right. And so obviously even in the Lord's, Lord's prayer, yeah. God has given us a model for repetitive prayers. Mm -hmm. And so does God get tired? Absolutely not. We're the ones that get tired. That's right. He doesn't. 